Anyway, on behalf of Oracle and Rotary, Rotary Parkers Rotary Club, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here tonight uh, for this first series, uh, first presentation in our second year series of Our American Roots. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, first of all, Reverend uh, David Allred and the Periodic Tables Program. Periodic Tables is a community effort that is based on uh, sound belief that if people just get together, sit around a table, and maybe enjoy a light meal or a meal together and talk, you can learn a lot about each other. And it may be your neighbors, or even better, somebody who's not your neighbor. So we're delighted that they have agreed to participate in this and help us financially with the food that uh, was presented uh, tonight and at the other uh, at the other presentations. I'd like to thank Berea College, who's the sponsor of this evening's program. And we're delighted uh, to have Dr. Cheryl Nixon. If you'd raise your hand, Cheryl, she's the president of uh, Berea, recently appointed. So glad that you're here. Uh, we really appreciate Berea College's support for this presentation. And we know we have a number of Berea alumni uh, in the audience, and I'm a little curious about how many there are. So if you're an alumni, alumnus or alumni of uh, Berea College, if you'd raise your hand. Well, okay. Very, very good turn. Thank you. We'd, uh, We'd love to have you join us for the remaining three programs on this series, say in March, uh, April, and May, and the schedule's in the program, and the topics are in the program. Uh, so anyway, I, we, we, I'd like to ask, join me in another round of applause for all our sponsors and donors, if you will. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Charles Crow, who is a member of the Oak Ridge Breakfast Rotary Club. He's also a graduate from Berea College and he's on the Board of Trustees for Berea College. So, uh, Charles will introduce our speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to not only introduce uh, a friend, but uh, I'll introduce someone we've gotten to know very closely in the last, over the last decade. Uh, Ted and his wife, Lisa, are no stranger to the area. They actually lived in the area for a while, but they currently live in Richmond, Kentucky. And they have two grown children and two grandchildren. And we spend most of our time when we're together swapping stories about the grandchildren. <laughs> but Chad is a uh, is a man who truly buys in to the motto of Berea College. And that is that God has made of one blood all the peoples of the earth. Dr. Berry is, has served as Vice President of Alumni Communications and Philanthropy at Berea College since 2019. Prior to that, he was academic vice president and dean of the faculty for eight years after serving five years as the director of the Loyal Jones Appalachian Center. Prior to coming to Berea, he was a member of the faculty of Merrillville College. So see, he's, he's been around this area. He knows us. Uh, he also holds faculty rank at Berea in history and Appalachian studies. Chad is an author and has a passion for Appalachian studies. He has authored, edited, or co-edited four books. He is the author of Southern Migrants, Northern Exiles, which was published by the University of Illinois Press and it examines the migration of millions of white Southerners to the Midwest during the 20th century. He is also the editor of and a co-contributor to the Hayloft Gang, the story of the National Barn Dance, an important radio program for Chicago that was instrumental in the development 
country music. I invite you to read the other author and editing accomplishments of Dr. Berry in the printed program. A member of, he was a member of Phi, or is a member of Phi Beta Kappa, and he spent a year as the president of the Appalachian Studies Association. Dr. Berry is a board member of the Mary Reynolds Babcock <coughs> Foundation and is a former member of the Hyndman Settlement School and the Pine Mountain Settlement School. He also serves on the board, press board of the University Press of Kentucky. And uh, before I bring it up, I have to share a little story about it. Valley. Believe it or not, uh, this event has been a long time coming. And Wayne and I had the pleasure of hearing him do a presentation about the people of Appalachia at the App Loyal Jones Appalachian Center about at least five years ago. And uh, we thought the presentation was so good and we learned so much about Appalachia that we just had to ask Chad if he would come and share it with Oak Ridge. Well, we asked him at that time. And of course he said yes, and I, I'm sure he probably thought, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but here, years later, you're going to enjoy something that we've been looking forward to for a very long time. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chad Berry. So there's one thing you have to know about, about me, because my wife reminded me, thank you very much, just before I started the presentation tonight, I do have more than one blazer. Uh, I realized that I'm wearing the same blazer in the photograph, but um, anyway. This is my Berea blue blazer, so it's um, part of my stock uniform. So, um, it's, Charles is right, this is such an honor for me to come back to East Tennessee anytime I mean no invitation, having, having lived in Blount County for 11 years, great years. Our son was born in, Blount, in the, the hospital in Blount County. And what I have always learned, uh, what I've always known about Oak Ridge is that it strikes me as the epitome of a learning community in the truest sense. And so that's why I'm really honored to be here. So it, we're going to have nine lessons tonight because I don't have long. If we had a semester together, we might have 48 or 93 or something. But we'll have to settle for nine tonight. And so I believe strongly that this, this region that I love is, in fact, the most misunderstood in the, in the country. And I want to start by acknowledging those who have come before us tonight, which leads me to the first lesson tonight, that Appalachia, and I put it in quotes, and I'll tell you why in a moment, this region has always been post-indigenous uh, uh, times of settlement from Europeans and Africans. It's always been a tri-racial society of Africans, Europeans, and indigenous people. And if you remember anything about this talk together tonight, it's this. It's very important, and I'll come back to it in a moment. The second lesson that I want to leave you with, and I'm going to go through this one quickly. It's an important foundational concept, but um, I have little time, and I want to go through it quickly. This might take two weeks in a, in a normal semester. So you're truly getting an abridged version. But physical geography has influenced the way, and here I'm mainly talking about European Americans or, or settlers of European descent because indigenous and African folk did not have the same rights that Europeans uh, enjoyed. So I'm not ignoring or excluding indigenous or African people, um, but I'm going to talk briefly about uh, how the, the mountains really dictated settlement, my second lesson. So let's say it's 1795, 
and a couple have made their way, a young couple have made their way here to Philadelphia, which was a very common and popular port of entry into the States. And um, they may have come from the British Isles, and what they badly want is to replicate to the extent possible the life they knew of their family that they left behind, their parents, grandparents, and so forth. So when I was an eighth grader and my wrestling, the wrestling coach of my middle school was my history teacher, he always talked about manifest destiny as this, it, he made it, a, maybe because he was a wrestler, he made it sound like there was a bulldozer that just plowed from east to west across the country influencing settlement in the uh, 19th century. Actually, it was more um, nuanced than that. Because if you figure, if you arrived in Philadelphia in 1795 and you went due west, as Mr. Geyer suggested to me in eighth grade history, you would have immediately run into what? Or eventually run into what? A mountain, right? A ridge and valley mountain that would have been nigh impossible to traverse. So instead, uh, people quickly used natural ways to settle the eastern half of the country. And they started going down south and westerly uh, through the Valley of Virginia and into the valley, the Great Valley of Tennessee, where it's you can stand in Knoxville and it's 18 miles to the Smokies and about the same distance to the Cumberland Mountains. Extraordinary valley. And as you all know, being East Tennesseans, this uh, influenced the course of settlement in our region uh, among European Americans. This was an economic frontier, a very important way for this young couple who has arrived in Philadelphia. They may have stopped in Stanton, Virginia to check out what the property uh, rates were. Oh, way too expensive. We don't have that much money. But a little fledgling settlement in 1795 that came to be known as Knoxville fit the bill. They would set out on a course of using children. Maybe this um, young wife could have expected 15, 17, 18 pregnancies in her life. Maybe um, 10 to 12 children might make it to adulthood because they were creating their own labor supply. As you know, it was very difficult for what they were trying to do. But it was an economic frontier. Others were joining them to a place called Knoxville. There were plenty of natural resources to, to exploit, like the great fertile soils of the Tennessee Valley, like the great trees that they would fell, and a high potential for economic opportunity. Okay. I'm sounding like an economist, and I'm really not. The <laughs> third lesson is, if I were to summarize the third lesson, it's this. And I'm saying this because you've, ta you've been taught, unconsciously perhaps, subconsciously otherwise, that Appalachia was born poor. It was not. It was not born poor. It was made poor. So until the Civil War, people like this young couple from the British Isles who came to, Phil uh, to Philadelphia and moved southwesterly into what became Knoxville enjoyed a middling economic prosperity. In other words, they found the economic and achieved the economic opportunity that they set out to discover. It took a lot of hard work, but they probably approached um, the autumn or winter of their life being pretty proud of what they had achieved. Okay? It was widespread among, Euro among Europeans. All right, 1840, their first generation, the first, the eldest son, 12 children, set out to do what their parents had done and grandparents had done. Where do they go? Westerly, like Mr. Geyer suggested? No. They actually went to the southeast. And this area in green, the Smoky Mountains and Blue Ridge, became the second economic frontier. Why? Because eventually, you know the story, this is Sequoia. So you know the, the birthplace in Madisonville in Monroe County. Um, gold was
was discovered, and you know what happens to indigenous populations around the world when something like gold is discovered, right? It's never a good thing. So the federal government the, uh, puts a mint, a U.S. mint, in Dahlonega, Georgia, and sets out to acquire and steal the land from the Cherokee, among others. The government approaches them and says, well, you know, you're savage people, and therefore we need to move you out. We've got this place, we're calling it Oklahoma, you're gonna love it, it's just like where you live now. <laughs> One of many lies they were told. Sequoia, Chief Sequoia says, oh, why are we, why are we savages? Well, that's because you, you know, you're pre-literate, you don't have an alphabet, you don't know how to read. Well, I can, I can create a Cherokee syllabary, and in fact, we'll eventually publish the Cherokee Phoenix in both Cherokee and English. Yes, this says the federal government, but you're not, you're still savages. You don't have private property like we do. Well, no, we don't actually. We're a matrilineal and communal society. We don't really think private property is the way to go, but if you think that's the mark of a civilized society, we'll adopt vestiges of it. Okay. Well, but you're still savages. Why? Well, you don't have a political system. Well, we do have a political system, said the Cherokee. It's just not what you would recognize. But in fact, what we'll do is we'll take your constitution and revise it and make it more small d democratic. How's that? And finally, the government says, enough. And you know what, you know what ensued the Trail of Tears, where 16,000 Cherokee were, from this area were marched. North, north, uh, northward, westward, and eventually settling in, Cal in uh, Oklahoma, at least 25, 30, 33% of them were to, would die. Generation three, same story. They went northwest because the northwest area, just outside of Berea, where the Cumberland Plateau uh, begins, was the third economic frontier. You may need more land than you did in the first or second frontiers because you, you know, I told you, we, we stand in the middle of Knoxville, 18 miles that way, 18 miles this way. You stand in a creek in eastern Kentucky, you can almost touch this mountain and touch this mountain. Not very much bottom land. Nevertheless, they, do, they replicate their ancestors' experience. Now, generation four, here's where it really gets interesting. And I've got pictures here. To, to, I love this picture. <coughs> Look at this group of people and this male of color here. All together, a black family in eastern Kentucky. Generation four has some real problems. Because by 1910, there is no other economic frontier east of the Mississippi River. It reminds me of when my grandmother always used a, a pressure cooker. And as a child, I would, be mar I would marvel at that little thing that danced on top of the, and hissed and wheezed and whistled and all that stuff. And I eventually learned how to shut the valve. And I shut the valve. Um, I later got threatened with a hickory cane switch by my grandmother who caught it. But that's what happened in eastern Kentucky when there was no place for these large families to go to to remake their lives in the way of their family before them. And when this happened, real economic challenges occur in the Appalachian region. And these Appalachian, or these economic challenges were built upon the fact that the Civil War in the Eastern Theater was largely fought in Appalachia's backyard. Houses were burned, fences were destroyed, land livestock were um, devastated, uh, property structures were burned. So when there was no economic frontier to which young people, white and black, could migrate, it was like that pressure cooker of my grandmother. The pressure, population pressures kept building up and building up, 
with no relief in sight. My point here is that economic change can happen very rapidly, but cultural change can take a very long time. What people had to do was in the upper left corner in this photo. What are they doing? They're mining, because that was an e a, a, a valuable natural resource that people could, uh, could exploit. But the situation meant that economics changed overnight. Appalachia was industrialized like that. And yet we don't think of it that way. We think of it as the epitome of the traditional region in America. So instead of creating your labor source, as that first generation was doing, 12, 13, 14 adult children coming to life, to adulthood, children suddenly, almost overnight, became a real liability. Right? It was an extra mouth to feed, or an extra 10 mouths to feed. And this was so because in a place like Leslie County, Kentucky, the county seat is Hindman, Kentucky, about an hour and a half southeast of Berea. In 1920, it had the nation's highest birth rate. Now notice the connection in 1920 with the generation of 19, uh, from 1910 who had no viable economic frontier. People ask me sometimes, well, yeah, but they could have gone to Iowa. Well, sure. Um, Young, a young person in Oak Ridge today could go to Singapore, but how likely is that, right? Um, and I'm talking about viability. So, lesson five. I put quotes around Appalachia because it's a social and cultural construct. By construct, that's kind of a highfalutin term for an invention, a creation, a bounding, a defining, taking a Sharpie magic marker and drawing it on a map and calling it Appalachia based on a 1653 term for the native, the indigenous population in and around the Florida panhandle called the Appalachian in French. So the way and when it was constructed, this is so important, and it makes me excited every time I, I convey this argument. The way and when it was constructed and defined and labeled and bounded um, and invented still influences how we think of the region and its people today. And the second, 5.5b, 5. 5 I snuck a B in here. A triracial region of indigenous African and European people suddenly became whitewashed. Because as Appalachia, in quotes, was invented, it left out indigenous and African peoples. It left out white people who might have been working in Lynch, Kentucky, in the U.S. Steel coal camps of Eastern Kentucky who were from Greece or Italy because suddenly only white Anglo-Saxon <coughs> Protestant types adhered to this new invention, the way that Appalachia was constructed. So by social and cultural construct, I mean the way it was la labeled, defined, where its boundaries were, who was included in the population, how it was discussed, how it was invented. Now, there are lots of places around the world today, almost every place is a social and cultural construct. Iowa is, happened when a big, that, black, that magic marker drew a square and called it Iowa. You know when you leave, what, Nebraska? and come into Iowa, how do you know? Because there's a sign, thankfully, 
<coughs> yes, it doesn't look very different, but welcome to the Buckeye or to what are they? The Hawk okay. the Hawkeyes, I don't know. Welcome to Iowa. <laughs> welcome to the corn state with 120 feet of rich black soil thanks to uh, Canada and the glaciers that brought it down to Iowa. But in Appalachia, there's no such sign. So you're not quite sure when you're in Appalachia. I know some Western people, some folks from Western Carolina would say that's the cultural hearth of, of, um, of Appalachia. And you, can, you Kentuckians are kind of newer upstarts or something. All right. Again, 5A of my argument is that the way and when it was constructed still influences how we think of the region and its people today. I would argue if Appalachia had been socially and culturally constructed during the time when that first generation around the turn of the 19th century was trying to make its mark in a place called Knoxville, Tennessee, we probably wouldn't have Chad Berry here tonight saying that Appalachia is the most misunderstood region in the country. Because that was a very different time and quite a different place. Because remember what was my third or fourth lesson about middling economic prosperity. They achieved what they wanted. It was hard, but they achieved it. It could have been in the second generation, in the Smoky Mountains, in the uh, <coughs> northern Georgia mountains, in the Blue Ridge. They achieved what they wanted. It was a very different place in time. But when this region in green, in eastern Kentucky, and in the Cumberland, uh, you know, the area west of here, when there was no viable economic frontier east of the Mississippi left, that spelled problems, and that conditioned the way we thought about it. Okay. So, who was defining and bounding, uh, boundarying, and uh, describing this new invention called Appalachia and its people. Ideas? Yes? Northerners? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was on the board, you heard Charles say, of Heinemann Settlement School and Pine Mountain Settlement School. You know, uh, wealthy single women who had no uh, intention to lead the traditional Mar you know, fulfill the marriage expectations of their lives, went, left, you know, Boston, Massachusetts, New England, and went to places like Hyman and uh, Pine Mountain in Harlan County and set up the, settle the rural settlement school after the Jane, Jane Addams Urban Settlement School. So they helped define uh, and describe uh, people in need, right? That's the way people began to think of, the, of this region, of people in need. If you saw the movie Song Catcher, which by the way, wasn't it filmed around here? Because I had Marigold students who were extras in that film. It's a great example of that, thank you. What else? Who else? Ministers? You know, I'm sorry, I don't want to be offensive, but you know, Presbyterian types, Methodists, uh, Episcopalians, Baptists came down right, to do mission work and discovered some peculiar religious practices, right? <laughs> Why can't you all just be regular Presbyterians like us? Um, I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. What else? Who else? The news media. Oh, thank you. The news media, right? Um, the Louisville Courier Journal and the New York Times during this time are replete with articles about the Hatfield and McCoy feud of Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. What else? Yes, because if you could make the people there a little subhuman, then it wasn't much of a stretch to convey to people that what you were doing in that part of the world very quickly in your industrialization efforts was okay. It had to be an improvement. And finally, well, there were college presidents too, like 
William Goodell Frost of Berea College, who apocryphally got on a horse in Berea and rode out to Jackson County and discovered our contemporary ancestors. That's what he called the people that he saw in the mountains in near, nearby in Berea, our contemporary ancestors. And finally, anyone else have an idea? Well, there were some doctors, there were some medical types, too. We found all kinds of parasites that they wrote voluminous articles about among these people that they discovered. Finally, the first New York Times bestsellers were what we now call local color novels written about the people in the green area, mostly by outsiders, but sometimes um, by insiders there, and became wildly successful novels at the time. And all these people were helping to construct so, uh, socially and culturally Appalachia and its people. Now, my sixth lesson, so you know we've only got three more, we're almost done. <laughs> Consequently, we've been taught through all of this continued social and cultural construction and reconstruction or discovery and rediscovery, every generation or so, Appalachian folk are discovered or rediscovered. Sometimes through a book or film or the New York Times or what have you. We're taught to conceive of the people in a region in a bifurcated way, another highfalutin term. And let me give you an, a visual example. Read this photograph for me. Tell me what you see or how it makes you feel. What do you see? Yeah, what is this stuff over here? Good. Often my students have don't, they don't, uh, you know, of this generation, you have no idea. Tobacco. What is this? What is this? Who is this? He's a farmer, right? What does he have here? My grandparents. My grandfather always had a set of mules. He had a John Deere tractor and a Troy built rototiller when they planted their two acre garden every year religiously. They were from Tennessee and moved northern to northern Indiana, which is why I talk funny. He always had a set of mules. What else? Look. His dog, his trusted companion. And what's he standing on? What did you say? Who said that? Yes. And tell, tell us what that is. Well, it's a non-wheeled conveyance. <laughs> oh, that's kind of, that's really technical. <laughs> a non-wheeled conveyance. I thought bifurcated was kind of high for the, I think you've beaten me. <laughs> All right, it, it is, in fact, right? Maybe he has a tractor and a wagon to bring in his, his, tobacco, but no. And look at the scenery behind him. How does it make you feel? Home? Doesn't it kind of give you a twin? Like, yes? Or does it, or are you on the other side, like the Dolly Parton song in the good old days when times were bad? <laughs> I, I think I'm using it as something of a moving image of tradition in Appalachia. I mean, he's probably replicated the life of his father and grandfather before him in the 20th century. Final comments about this image before I move on? There is so much, thank you, there's so much work, which is now you see how that 1795 generation, how much work they really had to do to achieve that life that they had come across the ocean seeking. Yeah, exactly, thank you. Anything else? So I'm gonna use this as an example of 
one of the two ways that we conceive of Appalachia and its people. This is, for lack of a better word, aww. That's, honey, why don't we move, retire and move to the mountains and live a simple life? We could get, or why don't we, why don't we drive down 75 and go to Gallenberg and rent for a week, an authentic Appalachian cabin. <laughs> it will have indoor plumbing, right? And we'd love to have a hot tub out on the deck, but wouldn't it be neat? Maybe there'd be a quilt on the bed or something? And we could stop in Berea on the way down, and we could buy maybe a quilt, and we could take it back home. We don't need it on the bed. That's so antiquated because we have an electric blanket and central heat, but we can hang it behind the sofa so that when the Kolaszewskis come over, we can have a, dis a conversation piece. That is so, ah, oh, that sounds really meaningful. And we could live, even when we retire, we could live simply like people in the mountains do. We could make all our food and and grow all our food and you could make you could knit more because you won't be working <laughs> I'm actually serious now read this image for me and this always gets the people Shelby Lee Adams photograph born in Hazard Kentucky trailer what else Thank you. Silas House, the great novelist who's on the faculty at Berea College, remembers distinctly how he was playing in the front yard as a little boy when a car sped by and said, trailer trash! What else? Why do these people have so many kids and so many dogs? Don't they know better? Head Start Family. What else? Good for them. Maybe I was kind of a string bean as a kid, though. I don't know. Our son is a string bean. What else? What does this suggest? What does this suggest to an audience in Oak Ridge, Tennessee? What might it suggest to an audience in Silicon Valley, California? <laughs> Austin, Texas. What? Poverty. All the, oh, you all know the nefarious stereotypes. I've heard trailer trash. I've heard Head Start kids. I've heard what? Welfare food stamps. Uh, the, the only thing I don't see is the moonshine bottle. Because you know what happens when he starts drinking the moonshine, right? What else are the stereotypes? They're nasty. But you all know them. Redneck. You're spouting them out to me. I'm encouraging you. You all know them. You've been taught them. And that's my point. Drug users. Yes. Trailer. That trailer just does not look very warm in the winter. And it sure doesn't look very cool in the summer. So that's my, that's my point. We've been taught to think in a dualistic way about the people and the region. The awe of that and the ooh of that. Right? Are you okay? Thinking? Are your wheels spinning a little bit? Number seven. We still have Appalachian quotes. Appalachia serves a particular function for people in this country. And had it not been invented, constructed, defined, labeled, described, etc., we would probably have invented another people and place to carry out the same kind of function as Appalachia and Appalachians do. Thank you. Thank you. This is not the only people and place who serve this function. 
Not the only place. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The place of rural white poverty. Mississippi, the place of rural grinding black poverty. The south side of Chicago, the place of, of black poverty. Uh, Native American reservations. So I want you to read this. I won't read it to you, but we'll go over it. It's tremendously important. late 19th century, Americans perceived, perceived, that's an important word, every word is important here, Appalachia is a strange place inhabited by peculiar people. Why do they go to church and handle snakes and drink strychnine? <laughs> this perception came not from reality, but the needs of middle class Americans. Oh honey, let's go down and rent that authentic Appalachian cabin. Let's make our lives simpler for a week. From the needs of middle class Americans to project either their own nostalgia for the past and or their fears about the future onto a people perceived as just different. Appalachia becomes the other, a place and a people on the, which, which side was the awe? To be admired, the awe side of interpretation. Or on the other side, patronized, bathed, dewormed, patronized, converted, taught, uplifted, disciplined, sometimes even emulated. Do you see what, how this quote is so important in this bifurcated or dualistic view of the people from the mountains? And I include the triracial groups in the mountains today. I include even, if, you're, if your last name is Gilbert and you've been here in Appalachia for 10 generations, you're certainly, you're certainly Appalachian. If your last name is Gonzalez and you've been here for two weeks, you can be Appalachian in my view. Or you can be Appalachian. <laughs> you know the image. You've been taught. How many of you have seen deliverance in your life? None of my students typically has seen de deliverance, so we have to show it. But they know wrong turn. How many of you have seen wrong turn? Okay, see that proves my point, almost none of you, <laughs> about somebody who makes a wrong turn in West Virginia and bad stuff begins to happen. You know, I study either, Charles mentioned this book that I um, contributed and edited on the National Barn Dance. My grandparents, it was their favorite radio show from the world's largest store, WLS in Chicago. They listened to it religiously, and my grandfather would often have a tear. Because living in northern Indiana, it just made him think that everything was home. And then the birth of country and music, country and western music, you know, every kid in the 1950s probably wanted to grow up and be a cowboy for Halloween, but nobody wanted to be a hillbilly. My assumption is the hillbilly mirrors us. He can flatter, he can frighten, he can humiliate. Deliverance. As a rough and ready from frontiersman, he can be made to compliment American men and masculinity. He can also terrorize. In short, we want to be him and we want to flee him. That, again, that dualistic view. My eighth lesson is probably the duh lesson. You have been conditioned, probably unmindfully, about your view of the region in which you reside and its people. Maybe the people not in Oak Ridge, 
maybe other parts of Anderson County. You have been conditioned, and it's important, it seems to me, to unlearn what you think you know. It's important to unlearn what you think you know. Here's another quote from Silas House from an op-ed piece he wrote a while back. Most people don't, well, most people think they know Appalachia, these people, because it's, it's so kind of pervasive, but few people really do, he says, because they haven't taken the time to educate themselves properly. I get students at a Berea College who've grown up in the mountains, and they've been taught Go to Berea and don't come back here. There's nothing to come back to. Get an education and go do something with yourself, which is terribly sad. And they've been taught to be ashamed of their history and their heritage. And then they get in an Appalachian Studies class and they become transformed because they discover that it's legitimate academic inquiry. And then they have this transformation where they just love and celebrate all things mountain or hillbilly or Appalachian. But our work is not done that at that point because they're just blind by, by a transformation. We've got to get them to the critical point to see what they ought to love and to see what they ought to change. That's really important. One must go drive these winding roads, sit and jaw for a while with folks on their front porches, attend weddings and high school graduations, study the history of the place and come to understand it, must sit and awake and look at the lines on the faces of the people, the calluses on their hands, understand the gestational and generational complexities of poverty and pride and culture. One must stand for a while outside the funeral home and smell the air, study the gravestones out back that await the inscriptions of names belonging to people, not statistics. If I had the ability to write something like that. <laughs> and my final lesson, I've traveled, I've been fortunate and blessed to travel to more than 50 countries around the world. Every country I've ever been to Ukraine, for example. Berea has a, an exchange between the Pre-Carpathian National University in Ivano Frenzkivsk in the Carpathian Mountains, which are uncannily similar to Appalachia. We took a delegation years ago to the Museum of Appalachia. And the provost in, in Ukrainian grabbed my arm and essentially said, Chad, I can't believe you put all these Carpathian artifacts on display here to welcome us. <laughs> I had to break the news. In, in, in Ukraine, it's the Hutsulian people in, in the Carpathian Mountains. In England, it's probably Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. In Cuba, it's the Pinar del Rio. In China, it's Southwest, it's the Uyghurs. Uh, you're having a, a talk, I see. Every place I've ever been has a, a Ghana. It's the northern areas. Um, every place has this trait that I'm talking about tonight, where people elsewhere are similarly thought of as Americans perceive the uh, uh, perceive Appalachia and its people as they're climbing the economic way. Wait, what am I stepping on? Oh, that's somebody else's fingers. Thank you.
We have cards, just raise your hand. And if you want to write it down, or if you want to just raise your hand, I'll recognize you since we didn't do this ahead of time. Anybody have a question for Dr. Mary? Yes. You did mention the melungeons. Yeah. Yes, they are indeed. You need to tell us what Melungeon people are for those who don't know. It is indeed. It's a, a, a mixed race people with some olive complexion and sometimes blue eyes. And um, there's a whole lot of intrigue um, bound up in Melungeons. Does anyone in this room have Melungeon ancestry? Very interesting mixed raced people. And um, there are novels about Melungeons, and in, increasingly with genetic advancements, we're learning much more. We're demystifying the Melungeons. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. There was a question right here. Go ahead. Well, I'd first say, I, I make a quip about talking funny because my grandparents left Tennessee, their beloved Tennessee, in 1947 and moved to northern Indiana where I was born and raised. Um, my grandparents always pronounced our last name Burry, you know, kind of the way people in eastern Kentucky say Burry County. They don't say, like me, Perry County. I lived in Maryville, Tennessee, and when I say Maryville, people say, you don't really live in Mar Maryville. <laughs> My point is every, every people, every person has an accent. At Berea, so many of our students from Appalachia have had their accents beaten out of them, mostly by eighth, ninth grade teachers who said, listen, uh, you're awfully smart and talented. You've got a bright future, but you've got to stop talking so country. Um, and then there's the notion with when, the, when Appalachia and its people were defined and bounded and labeled and characterized and described and all that. We, our contemporary ancestors meant, oh my gosh, these people are speaking Shakespearean dialects that have long been extinct in the British Isles. Well, that's not true. We know from sociolinguistics that's not true, but that was, the, that was part of the, our contemporary ancestors. This is, the, this is the glorious past of the ascendancy of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture right here in America as the, as the borders are overtaken by people from East Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe during the time of high, high, high immigration. And yet there's no connection to today, is there? Thank you for that question. But I, I, I teach a course on, uh, I've taught a course on dialect in, in the mountains. It's a semester long course. Jim, you had a question? I think Appalachia, if I were constructing it or defining it, it has a very big tent. There are some people I know who say, I could never be a, an Appalachian because I don't have that Appalachian identity card from birth. Well, when we moved to Mar Maryville, I, would, I was going in to get something at the courthouse and there was an old timer sitting on the benches out there and I stopped to talk to him and, and they heard my accent and they said, well, you ain't from around here, are you? And I said, well, no, but my great, 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 great grandfather died in Block County in 1804. Did you have people here then? <laughs> they didn't think that I could possibly be Appalachian, but I have this big tent view of Appalachia. If it started out as a tri-racial society, I think there's plenty of room to add more people. That's a good thing, I think. When I go to Whitesburg, Kentucky, and there are two or three Mexican restaurants and, and a Chinese restaurant and all that, because some immigrants are coming to places like that in the mountains, in the small communities. Um, I think Oak Ridge is a perfect example of that power of education and the belief and fulfillment in educational transforming, transformation, just like Berea, Kentucky is through Berea College. So I, I think I'm not threatened. I'm threatened by the way that a lot of corporations and some politicians can, um, it, I'll just use in Eastern Kentucky, can sort of 
uh, do damage by what they're telling people. And some of the people, because of the collapse of the coal economy, are so desperate that they don't have anything else to believe in, and they believe it, and they're going to learn that it's to their own detriment, I believe. That's what I worry about. Yeah, question is that. I have a question, two parts. Um, as, I, as I tracked you going through those nine lessons, I had two things that came to my mind. One, I was waiting. I was wondering if we continued, if if we would hear about um, getting to a point in time when it, it became easy for the government to come in and take people's land. Oh gosh, I've and, I've interviewed people down in whose land was taken for teleco. Uh, when I lived here, and the stories and the photos of the little tea in all its glories, and the beautiful rocks, and, and the dairy farms, and uh, I interviewed one person who um, whose land was taken for Oak Ridge. They moved over uh, elsewhere, I guess, into, what is that, Monroe County. This has been a long time, 25, 30, 25 years ago. Interviewed their family. Uh, of this man, you know, and when people are pushed out, the property prices go up. He was a farmer, and he finally found a farm, and then they took his land for um, Teleco. And he, you know, he had no choice, but he took himself up into his barn and shot himself. And then the idea of absentee ownership. Oh, gosh. So true. Another uh, semester long course that we would teach. Yeah. And again, I said, I, I'm glad you thought of those two really great examples. And there, there, there are other, going back to your question, those are things to worry about. Mineral rights. Mineral rights. Well, Kentucky at least has the broad form deed. Um, we never thought that that would, against the broad form deed, that we never thought that it would win in a place like Kentucky. But um, it did, it passed, so that is, you know, where a broad form deed was something that uh, people were sold in the early 20th century with the ascendancy and discovery of coal. And the broad form meant your deed went there, the deed that you sold went way deep and included all the mineral rights. So if your family cemetery, if you sold the mineral rights, your grandfather, or great grandfather, sold the mineral rights in 1920, and the coal company had the rights to the minerals below the surface. They could come in and plow through the family cemetery because they had a right. And in 1988, the, on a, refer, a statewide referendum, Kentuckians said, "No, this is not right." So that was a shining moment for people's rights and dignity and justice. It's a great question. Yes. One there and then one over here. Uh, your thoughts on Bill Billy Elegy, both the book and the movie. Oh my gosh. Well, I haven't seen the movie. I'm quoted in the book. So when this book came out, um, fans quoted me because of my study on migration. So he was you know, also a product of migration. People started emailing me. I got all these emails. Well, I read about you, and the, their assumption was, "Oh, you're friendly with this this author." I'm like, I have no idea what, who, what you're talking about. Well, his name is is this Hillbilly Elegy. Um, every ten years or so, a program on 48 hours, 60 minutes, or a book like Hillbilly Elegy comes out that attempts to take the most misunderstood region and its people and make it easily digestible in just a little tasty bite. And it's wrong. Yesterday's people in the 60s was an example. I can go through time. I can go through 48-hour stories or 60-minute stories or articles in the New York Times that take this incredibly complex place and people and give you that, oh, OK, I see why they're voting the way they are. They're voting against their um, their interests. Oh, I see why. Because they're lazy, dumb, and stupid, or whatever. But J.D. Vance probably would have been fine just to do a family memoir, yes. but and leave it. But boy, he needed a good editor because the editor would have stricken the last half of the book, where essentially what he was doing was being a gate closer. 
getting through the gate and locking it behind him and then blaming all the people who couldn't get through the gate. I mean, come on. Thank you for that question. I won't watch the question, or I won't watch the movie. Yes, well, mine goes along with what you just answered. I was going to mention Demon Copperhead as another example of a, of a book about this area. I think it treats it more kindly than Hill, Hillbilly Elegy. It, but I was curious about what earlier books you feel like fit that. But it's sort of, in a positive way or bad way? Either. either. Well, you know, I think I, I think the best novel about Appalachia remains uh, Denise Chiardina's The Unquiet Earth. How many of you have read it? It's a great, great novel. And when my students say to me, oh my gosh, this is the first novel I've ever read that I just can't put down, then they learn it's historical fiction that everything has happened. Then they really take interest. Um, I have had to take a hiatus from Demon Copperhead because it's just sometimes so real and so painful that I've had to close it. But you know, I know Dr. Art Van Zee in St. Paul, Virginia, who was a hero, a real hero, who started, he was a med school, Vanderbilt Medical School intern who came to, or a resident, who came to uh, Ch St. Charles and started treating coal miners in the 60s and 70s, he never left. And then he discovered, oh my gosh, why are all these people in St. little tiny St. Charles, due north of here, getting addicted to this wildly, this new drug? And then he set out to start a treatment program for him, for them. He deserves the National Medal of Freedom, in my view. And in, you know, Barbara's novel, Art was a, a real hero to her and to many others. Dr. Berry, you, you mentioned that region voting in, not in their best interest. Uh -huh. Why is that? Well, when you drill down into the voting data, um, my grandparents, uh, you know, they moved to northern Indiana, they worked, they got a job eventually to get, my, my grandmother said, I'm getting a job this time, my grandfather says, no you're not. She said, yes I am. She, he said, no you're not. She said, watch me. So <laughs> they both got a job at a Pepsi-Cola bottling plant. They hired in the same day. They did the same job. They were bottle inspectors that came through the line side by side. And they retired the same day, but when the Teamsters unionized, my grandmother suddenly made the same wage as my grandfather. That was $2.76 an hour when they retired. They found the economic opportunity they were looking for, but my grandparents never wrote a check in their lives. They paid, for ca ca paid with cash for everything, and they never voted. They were so disfranchised by their socioeconomic condition in the South, and even kind of in the North. They were called, you know, my grandmother poignantly told the story of trying to find an apartment in Mishawaka, Indiana, and it would say for rent. Underneath it would say no hillbillies. <laughs> so we know that like my grandparents, people in eastern Kentucky of the lowest quintile of population typically don't vote because they're disfranchised. If you look at the voting data, it's the middling, um, the fourth quintile that uh, a lot of political scientists say are voting against their interest in, an, in a, the old putting on airs notion. And, but yet the New York Times, for example, which I read every day, is not interested in such a nuanced story. It's easier just to say, to ask the, you know, disparage a whole um, 28 million people for voting against their interests, but it's way more complicated than that. But aren't they also abetted by politicians willing to hijack that nostalgia you described that some people feel about, you know, the way it used to be? I mean, they're yeah. willing to take that and then just sort of projecting across the board when in fact what they're doing is they're not being inclusive, they're yeah. being exclusive. In my yes, uh, so in my lifetime, in, 19, in the late 80s, as a graduate student, I went down to the Pittston area um, because the Pittston strike was going on, and Denise Giardina talks about it in her novel, The Unquiet Earth, and those miners and their families, especially the women, looked at people like me and said, oh my gosh, 
gosh, you could have done anything. You could have gone anywhere, but the fact that you came to spend a little bit of time with us is so meaningful. By 19, well, by two, well, earlier, really, but by 2006, when I came to Berea to direct the Loyal Jones Appalachian Center, I was persona non grata. I was over there in Berea. I mean, what is, what do you people at Berea College really know about us? Or are you just a bunch of tree huggers? I mean, in my lifetime, I was, I had that uncanny transformation by um, people, and, and that was the power of corporate messaging. 